Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Last time, we looked at Solomon's glorious reign as an archetype. Today, Pastor Victor shows five parallels between Solomon's golden era and Christ's coming kingdom, including, number one, eliminating rivals, number two, appointing new leaders, number three, peace and prosperity, number four, nations flowing to Jerusalem, and number five, worship of God central. This last episode of our Son of David class ties together everything nicely, providing us with a wonderful description of the Christian hope in the age to come that I believe you will find edifying. As it turns out, in every category, the ultimate Son of David outperforms the original Son of David. Here now is episode 434, part 6 of our Son of David class, Jesus Reign with Victor Gluckin. We just learned from the reign of Solomon, the early five things that he did. He rid the kingdom of enemies and rivals to his throne. He appointed new leaders. Uh, He increased his land and the peace and uh, the abundance that was there. Uh, Other kings and other nations came and learned the ways of God through him and of his wisdom and also paid tribute to him. And then lastly, he built the temple. So let's look at the reign of Jesus. Remarkably, we have five things that it isn't a stretch to have some uh, correlation here. I assure you, it's not just uh, trying to strain a gnat here to have five points that match. These are exactly what the Bible says in these things. So when Jesus returns, Jesus, the son of David, the son of God who will rule forever, the first thing that he is going to do is he is going to uh, stop and get rid of the rivals and enemies of his kingdom. The first thing that's going to happen, this great verse from Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this present age are going to be taken over. It says that the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his what? His Christ, his Messiah, his anointed one, his king, and he will reign how long? Forever and ever. Forever and ever. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So when Jesus comes, he's going to literally take over the world. He's not just going to come and do a quick U turn and like pick up all the saints and then go back to heaven with them. He is going to come to the earth, the saints will meet him, and then he is going to take over the world and stop those enemies of God. He's going to get rid of the devil and his cohorts. In Revelation 20, It says that I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he'll be released for a short time. But at the end of that, in verse 10, the devil who deceived them is thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the devil and the false prophet, uh, the final king, some people call the Antichrist, is going to be destroyed when Jesus comes back. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, it says that when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, he will deal out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day. And then also, ultimately, though not at the beginning, but Jesus will also destroy death and the grave itself. In chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 14, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So any opposition to God's kingdom that Jesus is going to rule over will be stopped and destroyed and uh, even death itself will die. That will be some of the early things that Jesus does when he returns to the earth. The second thing that he is going to do is he is going to appoint new leaders. And one of the reasons why this will be important is because 
when Jesus returns to the earth, it will be after a period of great devastation on the planet, a time of great tribulation and uh, other uh, cataclysmic things that are going to happen to the earth. But there will still be mortals on the earth at that time. There will still be humans on the earth that haven't been resurrected or haven't been changed, people that didn't turn to the Lord during this age. And they will still be on the earth, and Jesus and these newly appointed leaders are going to rule over them. So a lot of times when you read in Scripture about Jesus ruling and thrones being set up or rod of iron and uh, justice being done, it's because when he returns, it's not just going to be Christ and the saints happily ever after with no opposition. There will be people on the earth when he comes back that will be ruled over. And so he's going to appoint new leaders. First and foremost, Jesus will be the king. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33, we read this about his birth pronouncement, that he will be great, he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and that the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, verse 31 through 33, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. So when Jesus comes, he's going to sit on his glorious throne. He obviously is at the right hand of God right now in heaven itself. But when he returns, it says, then he will sit on that glorious throne and will rule, and it will start out with separation and justice and judgment. So Jesus is going to be the king. Jesus is going to serve as Solomon over Israel, but he's going to serve over the whole earth. Now, if you remember, the second thing that Solomon did was he also appointed other leaders. And one of the things that is said he would do is, or that he did was he appointed 12 governors to rule over the different tribes. Well, listen what Jesus said to his disciples. In Matthew 19, verse 27 and 28, Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What will there be for us? And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the what? The twelve tribes of Israel. In Luke 22, 28 through 30, he said, You are those, talking to his disciples, who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Solomon's kingdom, one of the first things he did was appointed these twelve governors over the, the twelve tribes of Israel. And Jesus tells that his disciples, his twelve disciples, are going to have that job when he returns. Peter, John, James, they're going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus is going to rule over all the earth, but the specific jurisdiction of Israel and the 12 tribes is going to be managed by his disciples. Because that's the way the kingdom of God works. Just like he did with Solomon, it's going to work like that when Jesus comes. Jesus wasn't haphazard in his selection of 12 disciples. He's forming a new Israel, a new people of God. It wasn't just his favorite number. But he did it for a reason. He's establishing himself as the new son of David. Also, there'll be rulers of the other locations on earth, and those rulers are the saints. And when I say saints, I don't mean just a few special people. I mean, God calls all of his people the saints. It means the holy ones. It says in Revelation 3, Jesus said in verse 21, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. In Revelation 5, 9 and 10, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have, talking about Jesus and what he accomplished, Jesus, you have made them, these people from every nation, tribe and tongue, to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will do what? So the destiny of those that have been bought with the blood of the Lamb is to reign upon the earth. This isn't talking about us like having control of everything right now, but when Jesus comes and sits on his glorious throne, he's going to appoint his people to have jurisdiction and rulership over different parts of the earth. 
Daniel 7, verse 27, it says, Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions will serve and obey him. So if you are a disciple of Christ, if you are a saint, if you've turned to Christ and uh, have been forgiven of your sins through his blood, your destiny is to rule the world with him. You don't get to rule over the 12 tribes, that's for his disciples, but you may get Guam or something, you know what I mean? Like, or maybe you'll get to, you know, rule over Rhode Island and fix it up a little bit, and, or maybe you'll be in Africa or, or in Russia, or maybe you'll be in Hawaii or something like that. Pretty cool. You know, Jesus told a parable to his disciples, and he's illustrating these truths in chapter 19 of Luke. He said that a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. He's telling them a story, but the story is representative about what he's going to do. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. So he's going to a distant country, a distant empire, to be crowned king and then return as king. After he was crowned king... He returned and called in his servants to whom he'd given the money, and he wanted to find out what their profits were. In other words, how did they do while he was gone? The first servant said, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Listen to what he says. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You've been faithful with the little that I entrusted you. You will now be the governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. So this is a parable about Jesus entrusting his disciples, entrusting his followers with responsibility while he's gone. When he comes back, he's going to ask, how did it go? Those that managed what he had left them to do well, he'll say, well done. And he will give them authority over different parts of his kingdom. Because after all, the master has left to go receive a kingdom and then return to administer that kingdom and have his servants rule over it. Pretty cool. You could look at some other places on your notes, Ezekiel and Revelation. So the second thing is that he's going to appoint new leaders. Jesus himself is king, his disciples as the 12, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel, and then you and I, you and I ruling over the rest of the world as now resurrected immortals with New bodies, new minds, new hearts. If you didn't think you could do it, he's going to make us new and we'll, we'll do just fine. We'll be like him. The third thing that we saw in Solomon's time was that there was peace, abundance, and the land. Well, on the wall here in Micah, listen to these words from the prophet Micah. This is years later after Solomon's reign. And Micah says that it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and many people will stream to it. Many nations will come to God's house, and they'll say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion, that mountain where the temple was built, will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Never again will they train for war. And listen to what he says in verse 4. Each of them in these last days will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Yeah. Right? Now, I was familiar with the phrase from Micah, but I didn't know that that came from the time of Solomon. It says elsewhere in Zechariah, in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. As I said, I, it wasn't until I studied the kingdom of Solomon that I realized that phrase, sit under your vine and fig tree, was a reference back to that time when Solomon was ruling over this glorious kingdom with peace and prosperity and the land and a great king. And so the prophets are telling us, hey, in the last days when the Lord comes, it's going to be like that again. Every man's going to be able to sit under his vine 
and fig tree. I thought about that phrase. Uh, most of you would remember this. It's morning in America again. Have you heard that phrase before? It's morning in America again. That phrase came from Ronald Reagan's re-election campaign, and it was this beautiful advertisement of the sun coming up and everybody going to work and everybody's happy. And you know, because during Ronald Reagan's second term, everything wrong with the world was made right. <laughs> Don't say it, man. Oh boy. <laughs> and so, and so. That phrase has been used other times to say it's not morning in America anymore or it's morning in America again, again, to reference back to that time when things seemed better in the country. And so what the prophets here are doing is using that catchphrase from Solomon's time, you're going to sit under your vine and fig tree to go, oh, yeah, life was good back when Solomon was in charge during his early reign. Well, that's what it's going to be like. When Jesus comes back, every man under his vine and fig tree, with no one making them afraid. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. We'll spend a few minutes in Isaiah looking at this next piece. So the Lord will rid the earth and the kingdom of his enemies. He will appoint new leaders. And there will be peace and abundance in the land. Isaiah 11 Verse 6, the peace during Jesus' reign will be so pervasive that it will affect all of creation. It says in verse 6 that the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Now, the lamb and the wolf typically don't dwell together. The leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fowling together, and a little boy will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, and the young, their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. A nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra, and a weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den, because they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. So there's going to be such peace and safety and abundance during this time that it's going to, it's going to affect even the animal kingdom, so that there will be peace amongst the animals and animals and humans again, like there was in the beginning. Adam named all the animals. They came up in front of him and was like, that looks like an aardvark with two A's. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's what it's going to be like again when Jesus is ruling. So cool. But let's look at the rest of the verse, uh, verse 9. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. In your notes it says in Zechariah 14.9 that the Lord, that Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. And Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. When Solomon was king, he ruled from the river Euphrates to the border of the land of Egypt. And that was pretty cool. That was the biggest expansion of the kingdom of Israel in history. When Jesus is king, there will be peace like there was in Solomon's time, but it will be across the whole earth. It will be so uh, powerful amongst humans and throughout creation that even the animals will have peace again together. And Jesus' kingdom won't be just in a little boundary in the Middle East, but it will be over the whole of the earth. The whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord like waters cover the sea. How does water do in covering the sea. It does a pretty good job. That's the way the knowledge and the glory of God will be on the earth when Jesus is ruling. Pretty cool. The fourth thing that we saw from Solomon's reign is that nations were flowing and coming to Jerusalem. Let's flip over to Isaiah chapter 2. Some of us are familiar with these verses, but to see them in light of the window we got to look through to see Solomon's reign these come to life. We saw when Solomon was ruling that other kings were coming to Jerusalem to learn of his ways and to learn of the word of God and to hear of Solomon and what he was like and what he knew. And in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it says that it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, come, 
Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many people. They will hammer their sword into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. We read this similarly in Micah, and here Isaiah has the same vision. When Solomon was king, people came to Jerusalem to hear the words of of God through his mouth. When Jesus is king, Jerusalem will be exalted as the chief of the mountains. Physically, even, it will look tall and high and and will be notable for that. Just like when you're in Washington, D.C., and the Capitol is on top of something called Capitol Hill. And Jerusalem and the mountain of the Lord will be exalted, and people will come to it, and they'll say, let us go and learn the ways of God. I want to hear His laws and His words. I want to understand these. I want to walk in His paths and understand His laws. That's what they said during Solomon's time, because something was happening in Jerusalem that the kings of the earth wanted to come and see and glean. When Jesus returns as king of kings and sits on that glorious throne, all of the earth will come and learn the ways of our God. So cool. Isaiah 11, it says that nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Not just in little pockets and a church over here and not over there, but the whole earth. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. In case any of you are being tempted to think this, these are not just figurative poetic visions. These are literal things that the scriptures say will happen when Jesus' reign is over this earth. The knowledge of God will be filling the entire planet. The banner of God will be waved all over this place so that people will come and learn if they don't know Him. And, And the people who are in charge of the earth will have the job of teaching whoever they're in charge of God's ways. If you're the governor of Minnesota, instead of reading the Minnesotan Constitution, you're going to be reading God's words to the nation. That will be what determines what's right or what's wrong. Not just because you hopefully voted in enough people that share your worldview, but because Jesus will be in charge and no one else will be. It will literally be like that. And he's not going to die or get voted out of office or have term limits. He's going to rule forever and ever. His kingdom will have no end. I could get into that. I could could enjoy that. I could dream that dream. Amen? Amen. That's God's God's dream for the world. And we get to to attach ourselves to this God and, and to Christ in advance of that and have these dreams and have a context when things are crummy in our world. And have a context when things don't work out the way we had hoped or evil increases or people that are in opposition to God are the ones with the platform or the spokespeople or the ones on TV or the ones influencing the children and stuff like that. We can hold fast and believe this is what it's going to be like literally and truly when Jesus comes back. In Jeremiah chapter 3 on the wall here, it says, verse 17, at that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord. Nor will they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. You tell that to your kids. Listen, one day, you're not going to walk in the stubbornness of your evil heart, so why don't you get on board now, okay? (laughs) So the nations will all flow to Jerusalem. The nations will all flow and the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Look at one more thing here. The house of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Jesus, uh, or Solomon, built the temple, the house of the Lord. And we'll read about 
Jesus and his connection with that in Revelation 21. You know, I feel like it's worth uh, mentioning here. I know early in my life I grew up not really having a clear picture of what my hope was about, what, my, what the future held. I, I, I thought that something like Jesus, I knew Jesus was going to come back. I was taught that, and the Bible clearly taught that. But I didn't know much more than that. I thought maybe I was going to be on a cloud in heaven. I thought maybe I wouldn't know if my parents would, if I'd be able to find my parents. I didn't know if I would be like a disembodied spirit or would I be like me? Would I know people? Would I be able to talk to people? You know, how would it work out? Could I, could I be in the clouds and then come to the earth if some people were there? Could I, what could I do? I, I didn't understand it. And one of the reasons why is I didn't, I didn't understand what the Bible taught. I didn't read the scriptures, I just embraced the tradition of what I had been taught. But then, man, when you get to the scriptures and start looking at this stuff, this is a glorious and clear hope. This is a a biblical hope from Genesis to Revelation. What God originally intended in the beginning, he's going to get in the end. He's going to have an earth filled with people who love him, who worship him, where there's going to be no evil, where we will know each other, where we... We'll live forever where there won't be any pain and suffering and God will be glorified. And, and so, so I have a great hope. We have a great hope. There's great clarity. This is, the hope is called an anchor for our souls, and it really can be that. So we don't have to be troubled or worried or just, you know, go with what happened to Bugs Bunny when he fell off the cliff and, you know, he floated away. You know what I mean? But we can actually have a true and biblical hope of Jesus returning when On the earth, God's will is done as it is in heaven. In Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven. This is about this temple. How is Jesus going to, how is it going to work with the temple? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned from her husband, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain, for the first things have passed away. Go to verse 22. So what John sees is he sees this vision of a new city coming down from heaven to the earth. And as a result of that, the dwelling place of God is amongst men and there's no more tears crying. And he says in verse 22, I saw no temple in it. So in this new city, this new Jerusalem, this final and eternal state when God himself comes to dwell on the earth, there's no temple. Why? Well, the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. There won't need to be a physical representation, a go-between between between God and man, because God's going to be there on the earth. We won't need His glory to show up in a cloud or fire to come down and go, Oh my gosh, this is so great. And then when the, the cloud subsides, we can go back in. No, but it says that, The dwelling place of God is going to be on the earth. And with us being made new and resurrected, we won't freak out and have to run away. The city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illuminated, and the lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, just like happened with Solomon. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those names who are written in the book, the Lamb's Book of Life. Chapter 22, verse 1, he continues on, he says, And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets on either side of the river was the tree of life. Last time the tree of life was around was in Eden, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's no longer any curse. 
and the throne of the God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of a light or a lamp or of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. So in this, in this final city, in this final state, after all the enemies have been destroyed and everything gets set right in the earth, the end of the story in chapter 21, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven to the earth. The earth has been made new. It's restored. And then God himself will come and dwell on the earth. And his presence will be on the earth again like it was in the garden where it says that the Lord God is walking in the cool of the day. And that Adam and Eve were able to have fellowship with the Lord himself without any uh, thing hindering that. No sin, no evil, no serpent. And that's what it will be like again in this glorious day. I'd like you to read at some point Isaiah 60 because it sort of brings it all together, Solomon's reign and what's used to describe Solomon's reign in the Messiah's kingdom. And the purpose of the whole thing is that God would be glorified. Pretty cool, huh? So just like with Solomon's kingdom, when Jesus and his kingdom begin, he will rid the world of the enemies and the rivals and the opposition to God's kingdom. He will appoint new leaders. Jesus himself will be the king. The 12 governors over the 12 tribes of Israel will be his disciples. And then the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom and will rule the world with Jesus for a thousand years. During that time, the land will be refurbished, replenished, restored. New life will spring forth. There will be peace on all the earth. Peace on all the earth. And even the animals will be friendly again. And you can have a lion for a pet if you want. Or ride a shark or something like that. You know what I mean? Whardever you want to do, that's fine. An aardvark with two A's. Go ahead. The whole earth will be filled with this glory and knowledge of God and all of the kings of the earth and all the peoples of the earth that didn't turn to him at first chance that survive and are here when Jesus returns are going to come and learn the glorious ways of our God. And they're going to, they're going to want to be taught his paths and they're going to want to read his words and they're going to have the opportunity for their lives to fall in line with his purposes. And then At last, after all this is sorted out and the earth has been restored, God himself will dwell on this earth again in a new city, a new Jerusalem, which will not have a temple because God himself and the Lamb will be here. So cool, amen? Amen. All right, so let's get some closing thoughts here. God shows us a glimpse of what he has planned for the world through the reign of Solomon. God's desire is to have the entire world filled with the people who love him, And who he can love. At the return of Jesus, this kingdom will begin, and Jesus and the saints will begin a period of 1,000 years of restoration and refreshing. At the end of this time, every enemy will be destroyed, and God himself will come to dwell on the earth with his creation, just like he did at the beginning. As we have seen, Solomon was a model for the ideal Davidic king, the literal son of David, who the Lord blessed and was able to accomplish many things. But sadly, Solomon did not continue on this path, but instead chose to follow after his own lustful desires and forsake the Lord, the God of his father David. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, became a fool. In 1 Kings 11 on on the wall here, it says, When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to Yahweh his God as the heart of David as his father had been. For Solomon went after the Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. This heartbreaking fall is where we find our final connection between Solomon and Jesus. Solomon, a man who had visions of God twice, a man who possessed supernatural wisdom and knowledge, a man who was the richest man of his era, a man who ruled over other great peoples, a man who built the temple of God 
classified as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was a sinner in need of a Savior. This Solomon, the first son of David, needs Jesus, the final son of David. And so do we. Our hope to be part of God's eternal plan and kingdom is not found in our biology or our riches, our accomplishments, or anything else. Our only hope is the same as Solomon's, salvation through the son of David, Jesus the Messiah. And that is why when Jesus came first, he didn't come as the conquering king, but as the servant savior. John three sixteen and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. In Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, Paul wrote that for while we were still helpless at the right time, who died? Christ. Christ. Not just Jesus, but the Christ, that king of the kingdom, that anointed one, that one who is the son of God, son of David, king forever. He's the one that died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man some won't even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, that king, died for us. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. It's possible, back to your notes, that Solomon may have repented in the end and found the grace of God as his father David did before him. Here is what might be his final words. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. Most believe that it was towards the end of his life. And this is the last phrase of this book. And he said, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or or evil. I pray those were his last observations and words, that he realized that after all the things he had experienced, what life was really all about was fearing God and keeping his commandments. But it can be ours. It can resonate in our heart that we want to not be like Solomon who trails off, but we want to be like Jesus who's faithful unto the end, fearing God and keeping his commandments. So, concluding thoughts. God is good and the Bible's awesome. Amen? Amen? We have a great hope and a wonderful Savior. And as real as the stories of Solomon are in the past, the things in the future are really going to happen in the future. And there's such a great story in this book for us to discover. And we'll finish with these words from Romans. Romans 15, verses 4, 5, and 6. For whatever was written in earlier times in the scriptures was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. So now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And while we wait for his return, let's pray that his kingdom would come and preach that gospel of his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these great lessons and these great truths from your scriptures. I pray that you would instill them in our hearts, that you would help us to dig deeper, Lord, into, the, into your Bible, into the scriptures to understand these truths. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a great vision for what you have prepared for your people and that we would live in light of it. We pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this in the name of your Son, who will be King of kings and Lord of lords, the Son of David, the Son of God, who will be our King now and forever, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, this brings this episode and this class to a close. What do you think? Come on over to restitutio.org and leave a comment on episode 434. Son of David, Part 6, and leave your thoughts there. We'd love to hear from you. While this class has been airing, I have been hard at work 
lining up interviews with a number of people, and I'm excited to be playing those out in the near future, including Theophilus Josiah, Eric Miller, Lori Jane, Daniel Calcano, Aaron Schellenberger, on a number of different issues that I think are interesting or relevant to us today. Also, I've been doing a fair amount of research on the theology of sin. I was assigned this topic for a theology summit I attended last weekend. I did a cursory dive into various systematic theologies and other books on the subject, and part of that was to find out what you thought about the doctrine of sin, especially original sin. So I put out a poll in the Restitutio Facebook group on that, and the number one position was that we inherit a corrupted nature, but not Adam's guilt, that we are born morally neutral, but predisposed to sin. This is the corruption-only position, uh, which had almost twice as many votes as number two, which was the idea that we do not inherit Adam's guilt, nor do we inherit a corrupted nature. We are born morally neutral, equally able to do right and wrong, and that's the doctrine of Pelagianism. I don't think I gave enough description for these, to be honest, because the Pelagianist position, which ended up getting quite a number of votes, it was number two, entails the possibility that someone can live perfectly righteously without Christ, that just as a human being, you're essentially in the same situation as Adam and Eve before the fall, and that given the right environment, you you would just always choose to do the right thing if that's how you grew up and that's the sort of world that you lived in. And maybe that is what people believe. Uh, I, for one, find that position very out of tune with my own personal experience, and I grew up in a very loving, nurturing good, God-centered environment, and I was a wretched sinner, and I found sin to be incredibly attractive. Uh, I wouldn't say irresistible. I don't think the doctrine of total depravity accurately portrays the reality of Scripture, but I would say that I had a, a tendency in that direction, certainly before Christ, and I would, I would even argue after Christ, to be honest, that I still have these tendencies, I still have these susceptibilities to sin, that it still appears good to me from time to time, and that I do struggle with choosing God over choosing uh, to gratify my flesh or act in some sort of rebellious way. Maybe other people's experience of Christianity is different than mine. Maybe other people, when they become Christian, they just stop sinning and it's no big deal. Maybe even before they're Christian, they're not sinning. And, you know, unless they're put in a terrible situation where they're traumatized and they become the victim of some horrible abuse, do they experience sin? I don't know. But I would say that the scripture is pretty clear that everyone has sinned and that everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And that if we say we have no sin, we're calling God a liar. And regardless of your how you work all of it out, that is, you know, that is where my theological stake is in the ground. Now, uh, there are many other questions to ask, though. Is the unbeliever able to do any good at all? I would say yes. Is the unbeliever able to have faith in the gospel message? Again, I would say yes. Is the believer able to live without sin? On that one, I would argue also, yes, it's the, the believer is able to. It's possible. But my experience and the people that I know, and maybe we're just a bunch of filthy New Yorkers that you know really are at the bottom of the barrel as far as Christians, no, people do continue to sin from time to time and in different situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, but we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit to help us come back to God, to repent of our sins, to confess our sins, and to be cleansed of all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Thank God for 1 John 1, 8, 9. Uh, so anyhow, it's a topic of interest. If you want to comment on that, feel free to comment on this post on restitutio.org, episode 434, or come on to Facebook and find the poll, What's Your View on Original Sin? We'd love to hear more from you, especially those of you who affirmed Pelagianism. 
including the idea that non-Christians are capable of perfectionism, which, I mean, I didn't say that in the poll, so I, I don't blame anybody for choosing that position that doesn't really hold that, and that's certainly my fault. But, uh, you know, if you really do hold that, I would love to hear how you account for the necessity of salvation and the the off-bandied phrase, works salvation. If doing the right instead of doing the wrong just results in your salvation, then there's there's really no need for Christ to die. There's really no need for for grace to be in our lives. Is there? Well, maybe there is. I don't know. I would love to hear more of your thoughts on this. Thanks, everyone, for listening through this series. Stay tuned for these exciting interviews. I'm thinking that next time up, we will delve into the Integrity Syndicate and Theophilus Josiah, uh, who's also possibly, not confirmed yet, setting up a debate between myself and Matt Slick on the Trinity, which would be a blast. Uh, although, uh, although he is a somewhat intimidating opponent, having been so seasoned by so many previous debates. So we'll see if that happens as well. We'll see you next week, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that online at restitutio.org. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.